Hi there, my name is Simon Drew and welcome to the Practical Stoic Podcast. Now, I'm really fortunate today to be able to present to you an interview that I did with none other than Professor Massimo Pigliucci. Now, Massimo has been on the show a couple of times before, once on his own and once with Gregory Lopez. Uh, and you can actually find these interviews on my Patreon page. It's just patreon.com forward slash Simon J. E. Drew, and I'll include the links below. But for now, I'm really excited to have him back. He's always so, uh, so kind and, and giving of his time. I know that he has a busy schedule, but I'm so lucky to have had him on the show these many times. Uh, and today we really wanted to discuss uh, the, the complete history of Stoicism. And you know, there are probably a few areas that we didn't go down, but we tried to go as in-depth as possible. And, and I was so grateful to Massimo for sharing his knowledge because he really is one of the foremost intellectuals uh, when it comes to Stoicism in the world right now. So he is very smart and he's got a lot of backstory that I want to give you and, and, and I don't want to get anything wrong, so I've got some notes here. But just so that you know who we're dealing with here, uh, so, Professor Massimo Pigliucci, he has a PhD in Evolutionary Biology from the University of Connecticut. He's also got a PhD in Philosophy from the University of Tennessee. Now, he is the K.D. Irani Professor of Philosophy at the City College of New York right now. Uh, and he's actually been published in places like the New York Times, the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and he also contributes to Skeptical Inquirer. Uh, and he's also... On top of all of that, the author of 13 books, including a couple of that you, you guys might know. Uh, one is A Handbook for New Stoics, a brilliant book. If you're just getting into Stoicism, you've got to get that one. And there will be links below to where you can get all of his books. And this one, I'm sure a lot of you will know as well, How to Be a Stoic. And uh, just a beautiful book that gives you such a great guide uh, to how to implement these Stoic principles into your life and find that eudaimonia that they talk about. So uh, I'm so grateful that you came on the show. You know, it was such a great conversation and I want your feedback as well. So let me know uh, what you thought of the show. If you have any questions for Massimo as well, we can include them next time when he comes on. Uh, but apart from that, uh, I just want to say all of the links to where you can follow Massimo and where you can find his work uh, will be in the show notes. So make sure if you don't have his books, go out and get them. They're absolutely wonderful and he's such a great guy. So uh, again, thank you so much Massimo for being on the show and uh, I hope that you guys enjoy this episode of the Practical Stoic Podcast. Awesome. So we are here with the one and only Massimo Pigliucci. Now, Massimo, thank you so much for coming on the show. Like I just um, I want to say from the start, you know, I really appreciate your willingness to share with us and um, you know, starting the podcast from scratch. I really wanted to discuss with you uh, essentially the the core historical elements of of Stoicism and where it all started. Essentially, what was the you know the genesis story of Stoicism. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, I, I figure you have, you know, as good a knowledge, probably better than most people about this, uh, especially seeing as you've written about it and you're thinking very deeply about the philosophy, but, um, welcome to the show. I'm going to let you start from where you want to start and then we can kind of pick up from there. Well, thank you for, for having me and for, for the kind words. Well, if we're talking about the origin of Stoicism, uh, obviously it didn't come from nowhere. Uh, no philosophy mm. does, right? There's yeah. always predecessors, influences, and, and of course then even once it started, it almost immediately started changing. Um, mm. But let's, let's go by uh, you know, one step at a time and, and look at the actual story as far as we know it, of course, because the, the sources of uh, unfortunately, from the time, are pretty scarce. The main mm. source that we have is Diogenes Laertius, um, the lives and opinions of the eminent philosophers. And mm. Diogenes, we don't know much about Diogenes himself, uh, interestingly. Mm. Yeah, but he was, you know, a collector of a bunch of books and, and you know, uh, trivia and you know, information of various kinds uh, about a bunch of all sorts of philosophers, including uh, the Stoics. So, Book Seven. Of the lives and opinions of the eminent philosophers is devoted to Stoicism, and it starts out with the story of Zeno of Citium, the uh, founder of Stoicism. And mm. what Diogenes tells us is that Zeno was a merchant; he was a Phoenician merchant, and uh, he was carrying a uh, on a ship a uh, lot of um, sort of uh, dye um, that was um, to be used for for clothing, mm. um, and um, 
the the ship, you know, uh, got into a storm. There was a shipwreck. Uh, Zeno lost his cargo. Uh, he was, however, uh, he survived and he got to Athens. And once in Athens, apparently one of the first things he did was to go to a bookshop because you know that's mm. what you do when you survive yeah. a shipwreck. <laughs> go to a, to a bookshop. And it turns out that the owner of the sh- of the uh, bookshop was. Uh, sort of reading out loud uh, Xenophon's Memorabilia. Uh, Memorabilia is a book uh, about the life of uh, Socrates. Hmm. Uh, Zeno was intrigued and he asked the bookseller, hey, you know, how do I find people like Socrates, you know, philosophers? And the bookseller said, well, there's one right outside the door right now, walking by and uh, follow him. And that guy walking outside the door was Crates of Tibis, who was a scenic philosopher hmm. active in Athens at the time. So Zeno follows uh, Cratius, he becomes his student, and then he actually moves on to another, at least another two or three uh, schools. He kind of, he learned, he frequented Plato's Academy uh, and, um, and a couple of other places. And then finally, after a few years, he feels confident enough basically to start teaching philosophy on his own. Hmm. And of course, his own, you know, his own constructs as well as his own understanding of what the cynics were doing as well as uh, the Aristotelians, you know, a bunch of things. He, put, he, he pulled things uh, that seemed to make sense to him and rejected things that didn't make sense to him. And he came up mm. with sort of these original blend. Uh, the, the, the original blend became known as Stoicism because Zeno decided fairly unusually to teach philosophy in the public market on the mm. on the it is the north uh, northwestern side of the agora, uh, which was the the open market in Athens. Uh, there is a place uh, that you can actually still today see the the remnants of. Uh, at the time, this this was a uh, place with columns and paintings, and and in fact, it was a porch basically. Uh, uh, and the term in uh, Greek is stoa poikile, which literally means mm. paint porch. Yeah. And so, because Zeno started teaching there. You know the people that followed him um, and started listening to his to his uh, teachings uh, became known as Stoics. Hmm. So that's the basic story. Now let's get back for a second. Uh, you know, so to what happened before, and, and then and then forward a little bit uh, hmm. about to what happened uh, afterwards. Uh, Zeno's brand of Stoicism was obviously in, uh, um, influenced by cynicism because hmm. Crates teacher was a cynic yeah he also studied with a group of philosophers that were particularly interested in logic and so he he picked up the importance of logic from from them Hmm. now the cynics were one of a number of socratic sects at the time so basically socrates who had died recently uh, you know a few decades before the the time that we're talking about by the way we are talking about the the, around 300 bc Right. Mm, yeah. And, you know, Socrates had died. Um, um, the Peloponnesian War is over. In fact, Alexander the Great had conquered Greece. And then Alexander is going to be dying soon, uh, causing the collapse of the, of the Macedonian Empire. That's just to, to give mm. you the basic in terms of uh, background in terms of history. So the cynics were street philosophers, were itinerant philosophers. They're kind of like Buddhist monks, uh, mm. almost, except much more in your face. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they had no I've heard some great things. stories about Diogenes. Maybe we could get right. into a couple a of those. <laughs> a different Diogenes, Diogenes of Sinope, who was a famous, a famous, a famous uh, um, cynic. So, mm. th- so they owned no property. They didn't marry. They didn't have children. Uh, they they lived a really minimalist kind of uh, lifestyle, and they were mm. mostly going around reminding people of the fact that they were not very virtuous. So. Yeah. Uh, you can really think, you know, the analogy is, really is monks, either Christian monks actually during the Middle Ages or, or Buddhist monks even in modern times, hmm. um, except with an edge, <laughs> with yeah. a little bit of an edge, <laughs> right? Now, um, that was one of the major influences on on Zeno. Of course, he started out, as I said, the story by his, his interest in philosophy was picked by Xenophon's memorabilia. So obviously, it was also influenced by, by Socrates hmm. and the Socratic uh, teachings were actually influential on, on all of the Hellenistic schools, um, the Cynics, the Stoics, um, even the, the you know the Aristotelians, the mm. late Platonists, which became to be known as the as the academic skeptics, 
Uh, even the Epicureans, even though the Epicureans actually rejected basically uh, much of what Socrates was saying, they were still working in rejection and therefore in, in, in comparison with Socrates. So mm-hmm. we should see all of these schools as kind of derived from or influenced by or, or in reaction to uh, Socrates. Mm. So it's and probably so- important that anyone who's studying philo- uh, studying Stoicism would also maybe go back and check out the works of, of Socrates, right? Like to, to kind of get Correct. an idea of, yeah, the, the foundations. And we have two sources for Socrates. Of course, the Platonic Dialogues. Uh, mm. Socrates himself never wrote anything down. Yeah. We have the Platonic Dialogues. And then we have Xenophon's. Uh, there's three books by, by Xenophon, including the Memorabilia, that talk about, about Socrates. What about so, works from the Cynics? Is there anything that we can look at there that, that would give us a good idea, or is it basically just stories? And, as far and, as I know, the cynics don't, didn't write anything down. It, it would yeah. have been kind of counter to their whole view of life, right? I mean, in order yeah. to write things down, you had to own stuff and, yeah. and you know have money to buy. Um, yeah. but you need to write things. And, and so they, they were definitely not into, into writing things. So um, our whole now, idea of the Stoics is based, sorry, the cynics is based around... Uh, these stories of them provoking people and, <laughs> and going yeah. around. Yeah, right. right. Exactly. So um, now we do have other sources about both Socrates and, you know, Socratic teachings and uh, and all the other schools, which are later, later sources, however, so later mm-hmm. commentar- commentators. Um, but in, ter- in terms of direct sources, we pretty much have only Xenophon and, and Plato. Fortunately, th- that's extensive uh, material, especially mm. Plato. So, so what does Socrates say then? Um, Socrates is the first philosopher to explicitly reject an interest in what we today call natural philosophy or science, right? Mm. So he's not, he was not interested, apparently early on in his career he was interested but in, in, in natural philosophy, but at some point he decides, look, the interesting stuff here to talk about is human beings and what they're doing and why they should do it or not do it. Mm. Uh, so what would they call Ethics, largely, right? So, yeah. so this was the first turn of philosophy toward ethics, explicitly toward ethics. Some of the pre-Socratics did talk about ethics, but not as their major sort of goal. And for Socrates, also, unlike for mo- many other philosophers up to that point, philosophy was a way of life. Mm. It, this is not something you just talk about theoretically. Uh, this is something that you actually live first and mm. foremost. Again, he was not the first one there. Pythagoras had done something like that before before Socrates. Um, but Socrates is the quintessential example of you know the, the, the guy who actually lives his philosophy. Hmm. Um, his major goal was to go around Athens and talk especially to young people and um, you know probe uh, what they thought about issues like justice and you know duty and honor and all that sort hmm. of stuff democracy and, you know, form of government and that sort of stuff, and largely uh, sowing seeds of doubt, right? The Socratic dialogues almost always end in what is called aporia in Greek. Aporia is basically, basically a confusion or mm. inconclusions, right? So there's no dialogue in which you, at the end, you get to the end of it and, and you say, oh, so that's what, the, what Socrates was getting at. This is mm. the answer to the question. It never is an answer to the question. Mm. You can't kind of take get get an idea of where Socrates was leaning by his questioning of other people, of his acquaintances, but you never get a, a, a particular, particular clear, straightforward answer. And there is a reason for that, because his method was more about questioning people and let them realize that they really didn't know as much as they thought. Yeah. Was he really the start of that... Uh... It's it's almost as if every great mind throughout history has come to the conclusion that the more I know, the less I actually know. Right? It's like, like the, the a problem can't be solved as simply as here's the answer. It's like, well, this is the answer plus this plus that plus this. You, there's so many different. It, was right. he really the start of that kind of movement towards understanding that we know absolutely nothing? Well. Um... There were some philosophers that expressed uh, skepticism before, and, and skepticism itself became a major philosophical school mm. um, after Socrates. But Socrates was known as uh, the, 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 the wisest person in, in Greece precisely because he knew that he didn't know. Yeah, um, yeah. But he was aware of his own, his own ignorance. That's what the— That's powerful. Uh, 
yeah, that's what the um, uh, Oracle at Delphi had told one of his friends that that Socrates was the most wise person in uh, in mm. um, Greece, and Socrates didn't understand that. He's like, "What do you mean? I, I don't know anything." Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's why and, you're the most wise person because you realize your, the, the 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 extent of your ignorance. Yeah, yeah, and and that's such a that's such a powerful thing for people to realize as well. Like that's the more you learn, the more you come to that stage of understanding that there's just way too much for us to understand and to comprehend. And, and that's, and it's not, it's, it's, it's quite powerful and it's exciting to know that, right. It, it's, it's freeing to know that there is, that there's just so much that we don't know. And you mentioned the Oracle for those who don't know, can you explain what an Oracle is and then maybe share the story of Zeno as well? Because I know that Zeno went to see an Oracle, right? Or is that just a story? We don't know if it is. I mean, it, there are yeah. a bunch of stories. About, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, right. So I don't. I don't know that we should give necessarily that much credence, especially when oracles are concerned. Oracles uh, were essentially people who were were in contact with the gods. Mm. And one of the most famous one is the one at Delphi, but there were four or five major ones in, in ancient Greece. Yeah. And uh, the oracle will essentially the, the notion was that the god will actually speak through the oracle. Mm. And um, and usually uh, the, these these speaking was not very clear. It was open yeah. to a number of different interpretations, right? Mm. So one of the, my favorite, for instance, um, is uh, at some point the, the Greeks went to the Oracle at Delphi. The Athenians went to the Oracle at Delphi when they were under threat from from the Persians. Mm. And um, and you know it's, it's like. What, what are we supposed to do about this thing? You know, the Persian army is huge and it's you know it's mm. taking over Greece. And what, what's going on? And the oracle said, "Well, um, you will defend your city uh, by erecting a wall of wood." Mm. And the Athenians is like, "A wall of wood? That's not going to do me anything. I mean, that's not going to stop uh, the, the the Persian army." Until one of their brilliant general uh, generals, Themistocles, realized, interpreted the oracle correctly or imaginatively mm. uh, and uh, he said a wall of wood he means ships mm. we need to fight sea uh, not on land because on land the Persian army is un- unbeatable but on, at sea they're not good yeah and sure enough uh, the Athenians put to put to sea and eventually defeated the the, the Persians in a major battle Hmm. Um, uh, so, so that that was the notion about the oracles. Of course, the oracle, uh, you know, in, what the oracles were saying was going to be interpreted in a number of different ways, depending yeah. on you know who was uh, doing the interpretation and what their mm-hmm. their own reasoning and, and interests were, and so on and so forth. Um, but the reason the oracle is interesting is because we actually know of even philosophers, including Zeno you know, and Socrates, who mm-hmm. actually went to. Oracles, which means that they were a major component of Greek life, uh, yeah. in a sense called sort of Greek spiritual life. Hmm. Um, but you know, these are stories, and they're hard to you know, they're, they're impossible to confirm, and yeah. uh, they, they, they make for fun anecdotes. Yeah. Um, but I want to go back to the influences on, on Stoicism for a minute. Yeah, so please. we talked about Socrates a little bit, um, and uh, Socrates, of course, the, the notion was not only. Um, that you should carefully consider uh, that you're actually you probably lo- know less than you think. Um, that did influence the Stoics because the Stoics uh, came up with their own you know theory of epistemology, the theory of, of mm. truth, based, of theory of knowledge. Um, he also Socrates most importantly thought that we should live virtuously, and of course that was the major point of. Uh, Stoic philosophy that that you should practice the so-called cardinal uh, cardinal virtues mm. uh, practical wisdom courage justice and temperance So that was one major influence. Um, we I already mentioned the cynics, but there are also other schools as I said uh, Crete is also uh, sorry um, Zeno also went to study logic and sure enough logic is a major part of the Stoic system the Stoics thought that philosophy is made of three parts that we should to study uh, in, a, in an interactive way. The mm-hmm. most important is the ethics, is, um, which is literally understood as the study of how to live your life. Mm. But the ethics by itself isn't gonna do it because well, how, how, how are you gonna study how to live your life? Well, you need two other components, what they call the physics, 
uh, which had a much broader meaning at the time than we mean today by the word. Physics mm-hmm. really refers to everything about the natural world, so basically science. Yeah. Or, or a combination of science and metaphysics. Mm-hmm. Why would you need that? Well, because y- you cannot live a good life um, unless you actually understand uh, how the world works. If you're under severe misconception about how the world works, you're probably going to mislive mm-hmm. your life because you act on, on the basis of bad assumptions about the world. Yeah, and third, the third field was logic, which also was broadly construed as pretty much anything that improves human reasoning. Why? Mm. Well, because if you don't think correctly, if you don't reason correctly, then a you're not going to understand the physics, and b you're not going to implement, be able to implement the ethics. In fact, there is a wonderful passage in Epictetus' Discourses, where at some point, one of his students says, you know, but do I really need logic? Do, do I really need to study logic? It's like you know, it seems like the ethics is really what, what's important. And Epictetus turns to him and says, well, uh, would you want me to, to make an argument about why you need logic? And the student says, yes, of course. And how would you, understood, would you understand that argument unless you studied logic? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you can so, see exactly yeah. where he's going with that from the first moment that he speaks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Uh, well, you know, it's a catch-22 kind of situation. Now, um, that said, the logic, both the logic and the physics were... Uh, supplementary, they were complementary to the ethics. The the really big part of stories is about the ethics, is how, how mm-hmm. to deal with other people, how to live your life, that sort of stuff. Yeah. So those are the major influences. But then again, once the Stoicism got started, it uh, you know the Stoics in, entered in dialogue uh, and cross criticism with other schools, the Peripatetics, which were the followers of Aristotle, mm-hmm. uh, the academic skeptics, which were so called because they were based in the academy, Plato's Academy, although Plato was long dead at that mm-hmm. point, and they turned, sort of turned toward skepticism, toward you know, not, not maintaining any particular opinion too strongly, uh, mm-hmm. because you never know, because, because human knowledge is impossible, according to the, to the skeptics. And of course, the Epicureans. Right? So, the, the, so we have records of back and forth among these three or four schools, and that, to some extent, changed each one of these schools, because they were, they were having to respond to criticisms. So for instance, mm. my favorite example is that the academic skeptics and the, and the Stoics started out with very different notions of epistemology, very different theories of truth, of knowledge. Mm. Uh, as I said, the skeptics said basically that there is no such thing as human knowledge, that, that because your senses uh, can mislead you, your reasoning can go wrong without you noticing, so really there is no knowledge, and therefore you should mm. hold no opinion. Right. Mm-hmm. The Stoics started out kind of the opposite extreme. It said, no, at least the sage, not not most people, but the sage, the ideal Stoic, the best possible human reasoner, he will have knowledge of things because his reasoning abilities are perfect. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so even given correct information, he will in fact arrive at correct conclusions. Well, so this back and forth then eventually ended up with kind of a compromise because mm-hmm. The, the, the skeptics pointed out that maybe the, the sage can get to that point, but since there is a no sage out there to be seen, or at least the sage is incredibly rare thing, so most, most of us can't use that kind of theory of knowledge, so, so mm. it's not very useful. So what about the rest of us? And the Stoics uh, counterpointed that, well, look, if you really believe that you should hold no opinions, then on what basis are you going to act? Because mm. when you act, when you make, when you make, decide on action, a course of action in life, presumably you, you do it because you think that's the right course of action, or you're going to act randomly. That mm. doesn't make sense. So the skeptics say, well, yeah, that's right. So some opinions are better than others. Yes, they're still not knowledge, but they're not, but they're, you know, some opinions are in fact more likely uh, than, than others. So in the end, the kind of they converged, the, the Stoics granting it, yeah, sure, at best the sage has knowledge. The rest of us have to go on the basis of opinion. Hmm. And the skeptics sort of granted that, yeah, not all opinions are created equal. So it is okay to hold on to some opinions, although you should do that lightly because you, it might still be the case that you're wrong. But yeah. you have to hold some opinions, otherwise you don't, um, you, you can't, you can't act, cannot act. Hmm. So these, these discussions were not, went, went on for you know centuries, literally, yeah. <laughs> and, and they kind of modified. There were also discussions internal to stoicism. Like Cleanthes, who was the second head of the, of the uh, Stoa after Zeno, uh, had some opinions that were different from those of Zeno's. And more importantly, Chrysippus, who was the third head of the Stoa, 
definitely had opinions that were at odds on a number of, of subjects, especially logic, mm. uh, with mm. those of Zeno. And yet he was so influential that Diogenes Laertius in the Lives and Opinions of the Eminent Philosophers tells us that if it were not for Chrysippus, there would be no Stoa, meaning mm. that Chrysippus mm. influence was so big and that most of what we understand today as Stoicism comes from Chrysippus, that if he had not uh, you know, being there, you, you would have a, some a completely different uh, sort of philosophy, and it might not have survived because, in fact, there is a reason to believe that the Stoa was in decline on, under Cleantes because Cleantes was a hard worker, uh, but he was not a particularly charismatic um, mm. leader or philosopher. Mm. So, sort of attendance to the to the his lectures went down. It was Chrysippus that kind of resurrected the whole the whole thing, and that didn't stop. I mean, the, when when the Stoa moved uh, to outside of Athens and, you know, Stoics started moving and teaching in, in different places, in Rhodes, in Alexandria, uh, in Egypt, and especially in Rome, uh, that was the period of the so-called middle store. The two mm. major people in the middle store are Panicius and his student Posidonius. And we know that they also disagreed, not just with Zeno, but with Chrysippus. And then later on, uh, once you have the so-called late store, those are Seneca, Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus, and all those others, um, Seneca clear, explicitly says in the letters to Lucidus, like, you know, these people that preceded us are not our masters, they're, they're just mm. our teachers. If I, if I reasonably disagree with them, I am going to disagree. And it's not, it's, not, it's not that just because Zeno or Chrysippus said something and that goes. This is not, it's not the Bible. It's not, it's not yeah. scripture. Yeah. Um, so we, we really need to realize that Stoicism started out uh, with multiple influences. It almost immediately began to change, even in the first two or three generations of, of mm. teachers, and, so and it kept changing. Right. So this kind of Stoicism you see in Epictetus, for instance, is very similar to some, in some respect, to the original, to the early Stoicism of, of Zeno and Chrysippus. But there are also major differences. He talks about things like uh, role ethics that we, did not exist. Uh, and in the time of Chrysippus, you know, were not articulated in the early Stoic, as far as we know. Um, he, he, um, Epictetus uh, sort of added this notion or, and made it central to his teachings of um, the three disciplines of, of um, desire, uh, action, and assent. He organized his entire philosophy around those, and he talked very little about the, the four virtues, if, mm. if at all. So that was a fairly major shift, and we're talking now 500 years after Zeno. Uh, was was practicing you know, 400 years after Zeno you know, was practicing. Yeah. So that kept going because even after the the end of the uh, um, sort of the third store, the, the the late store. So under, after the end of the Roman Empire, when pretty much all of the Hellenistic philosophers went, uh, uh, you know, they, they had no no more influence. They were the school, schools were closed. Christianity uh, became the dominant, you know, sort of religious and philosophical force in in the West. Even then, Stoicism kept influencing a number of people, including several Christian uh, writers. And when it reemerged for the first time officially during the Renaissance under what it's called Neo-Stoicism, which was uh, put forth by a guy named Justus Lipsius, and that influenced people like Montaigne and Descartes and so on and so forth. Mm. Well, there, there were major differences. Lipsius was trying to uh, actually reconcile Stoicism with Christianity. Now, move forward another, you know, uh, 400 years close to and now we are into modern stoic, stoic movement and there, we, we're, we're having these discussions about well, which yeah. part of the religion you know, should be retained uh, there's a big discussion about the stoic notion of God and providence you know, should that stay, should that go what happens if it, if it goes so really people should understand it. and, and stoic of course is not an, uh, an exception it's, it's the norm all philosophies and in fact all religions evolve through time Mm, yeah, and they evolve yeah. because they adapt to, to to different times. They, you know, modern Christianity is not the Christianity that was practiced two thousand years ago. Yeah, right? uh, modern Buddhism is not the Buddhism that was practiced two thousand years ago, two and a half millennia ago. So, so everything changes. Which, interestingly, it's a famous phrase put forth by the uh, pre-Socratic philosopher Heraclitus, the guy, the guy that said that we never step twice into the same river. Mm. Precisely because everything changes, you know, pantare in, in Greek. And Heraclitus himself was a major influence on the Stoics. Mm. So the Stoics, all of their physics, 
uh, Marcus Cerritos mentions several times Heraclitus. Uh, they got a lot of their physics from Heraclitus. They, they have this notion that the universe is always constantly changing, that nothing ever is permanent. So it's a broad picture, but, but what I want to stress is just the, enorm the enormous amount of dynamic, dynamicism and change that has occurred from the beginning and the number of influences on, on Stoicism. So there's, no such thing, there's never been such a thing as a sort of pure Stoicism. I don't even yeah. know what that would mean. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And I, I, think, I think what I've gotten from this so far is there's, there seems to be three kind of themes among the early Stoicism and moving into the future now. Uh, f firstly, there needs to be debate amongst all of the people who are, who are trying to figure out Stoicism, right? There needs to be a healthy conversation between everybody trying to figure out, uh, you know, how do we take this into the new age and then into the next age and then into, cause, cause things are constantly moving. Uh, I, I really want to, uh, stress as well, how important I think it is that you mentioned that the Stoics felt as though as human beings, we also need to understand nature and physics and science and like that, that's, that's a part right. of, of being, uh, I, I guess, an intelligent human being and a human being who understands uh, their place in the world. And that probably played a large role in the Stoic principle of aligning with nature, right? It's like understanding Correct. your exactly. place in the world and understanding what, you, what role you play in the giant scheme of the universe. Um, and we yeah, can come, sort of, I mean, uh, yeah. As you mentioned, it was uh, one of the, 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 the stoic sort of motto, in a sense, was that, that we should live according to nature. This mm. phrase is actually found in Zeno, uh, and then Cleantes and Chrysippus, all three of them, uh, used mm. it, and, and refers in Marcus Aurelius. So it's it's found throughout uh, ancient stoicism. But what does that mean, mm. uh, living according to nature? Well, if you don't understand nature, you cannot live according to nature. Yeah. Um, and and so Chrysippus was once again the one that crystallized it, and basically he, he actually specified not just cosmic nature, not only the way things work in the universe, but particularly human nature. Hmm. And what does that mean? Well, for the Stoics, the most important uh, aspects of human nature were the fact that we are capable of reason, right? even though we don't necessarily reason well all the time, but yeah. but we're capable of reason, um, and we are eminently social animals. Mm. Uh, those were the two fundamental characteristics. So living according to nature for a human being means use reason to improve uh, social being, social well-being, social mm. so, uh, the human cosmopolis. Yeah. Yeah. And so can you explain that as well, their, their view? I know we're going outside of the history and more into the theory of, of Stoicism, but uh, can you can you explain the the cosmopolis there? Like, Because that's something I really want to discuss a lot more going into the podcast as well. What did they mean by cosmopolitanism? So the, the word actually come, goes back to Socrates. Um, mm -hmm. Socrates, um, well, I think actually the word was coined by the cynics, mm -hmm. but the notion goes back to Socrates. Socrates uh, uh, famously, uh, Epictetus tells us that he was famously asked, um, you know, where are you from? And instead of answering from Athens or from Corinth, he said, I'm a citizen of the world. Mm. And that the word cosmopolis literally means city of the world, okay? Mm. And um, the cynics used this, um, particularly Diogenes of Sinope, uh, used this as their, their basic uh, sort of understanding of how to deal with other human beings. We are all brothers and sisters. Uh, we all exist uh, for each other's help and, 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 and benefit, and we should treat each other as equals, basically. Mm. Now, Stoics, then elaborated significantly on that idea, uh, arguably the most um, famous Stoic elaboration on the, of the idea of, of cosmopolitanism comes from Hierocles, who was a second century Stoic. Uh, unfortunately, we only have fragments of his book on ethics, but one of these fragments is particularly important because it's the one where he talks about these concentric circles. He says, you know, imagine that you are at the center of, a, of your own universe, obviously, because mm. we all start ourselves, right? This, um, but then the next circle out is your family, and then the mm. next circle is your friends, and then the one after that is your fellow citizens, and then the one after that is your fellow countrymen, and then the one after that is humanity at large. Mm. And what I heroically said is that the, the, the thing to do constantly is to try to collect these circles closer and closer to you. So uh, treat your friends as if they were your family. Treat mm. your 
citizens as if they were your friends. Treat your countrymen as if they were fellow citizens, meaning, meaning ab inhabitants of the same city. And then finally, treat humanity at large as if they were your, your countrymen. Right? Yeah. And so, so this is uh, uh, st the basics of, of uh, Stoic cosmopolitanism. A lot, a lot of interesting things follow from it. Um, for one thing, as I said, that we should treat anyone, everyone, not, doesn't matter gender, uh, ethnicity, or anything like that. The Stoics were very clear from Zeno on that women have the same mental powers as, as men. Therefore, they mm. should be uh, treated accordingly. They should be studying philosophy and practicing philosophy yeah. uh, because we have, you know, there's nothing that, that stops them from, from doing that, other, of course, than the prejudice of men. Mm -hmm. um, but... Um, so this notion that, and, and uh, Marcus Aurelius at one point says, interestingly, so as Antoninus, is, you know, one of his names was Antoninus, which he got from his father, Ant Antoninus Pius. Uh, as, an Ant as an Antonine, I'm of course a citizen of Rome, but as a human being, I'm a citizen of the, of the, of the world. Hmm. And what he means by that is that, sure, of course you have duties toward your more immediate circles, right? We have duties toward our family, friends, country, etc. But ultimately, the duty that is most important of them all is the one about uh, uh, the entire human race. So yeah. we should never do anything that undermines the well-being of the human cosmopolis. And some modern Stoics are, are picking on that and expanding it to argue, I think fairly convincingly, that this implies also a duty toward other animals and the environment. Hmm. At the very least, because treating the environment well and treating other animals well is also good for you for human well-being right it's, it's, yeah. a, it's kind of a um, self um, you know uh, self-help kind of, uh, of of argument for taking for stewarding uh, the environment um, so so stoic cosmopolitanism is important historically because the stoics and the cynics were the first at least in western philosophy to really articulate that notion mm. and it's very much uh sort of right, uh, germane today, because today we, we still talk about national boundaries and, and you know, uh, turn people away, um, you know, turn refugees away and things like that. And the Stoic, for, the, for a Stoic, there is no sense in doing that sort of stuff. Yeah, national boundaries are there, but they're kind of, but they're artificial and entirely accidental and they change over time. Hmm. On the other hand, membership in the human race is fundamental. Hmm. And and I wanted to ask as well, because it seems like uh, based on this principle of cosmopolitanism, where you focus on expanding your circles, would it be right to say that this, uh, Stoicism is a philosophy that is very much, it, it places a very high importance on the individual responsibility to to start by doing the best things that you can do for yourself, then for your family, then for, you, as you say, you know, then for your family, then for your community is is is. Is it kind of like that, or is it more of an outward look first? Do you think? No, I think I think it is like that. Um, it's a, it's a bottom up kind of philosophy in a yeah. sense, meaning that you know ethics begins with you, and yeah. and, and it begins with you for a very good reason. Um, mm. Following Epictetus' dichotomy of control, the only things you control are your own opinions and decisions yeah. to act, not to act. You don't control yeah. other people's opinions. You can influence them, mm. uh, but you don't them and so so it, it starts with you it begins mm. with you and of course the notion is that if everybody starts being a little bit more you know uh, uh, focused on, on improving themselves then the entire human cosmopolis becomes better this is not unusual however you find it's basically every other type of virtue ethics is uh, um, also starts with the individual yeah. and grows up from there right whether you are uh, a cynic or a, or a Epicurean uh, or, or, or anything else. And in fact, it's found also in other philosophies, both Buddhism and Confucianism. And mm -hmm. in fact, Tao, uh, they all begin with the individual. It's, yeah. it's all about you know, individual responsibilities and duties uh, to act or not to act uh, toward mm -hmm. other human beings. Um, so this notion that ethics is about sort of from the Top, a top-down uh, system. It's a modern notion. In fact, it's a modern Western notion. Yeah. In particular, I'm talking about Kantian deontology or utilitarianism, you know, things like that. That's actually an aberration, if you think about it. I mean, I understand it's it's it's, a, it's the dominant way of thinking about uh, moral philosophy right now in the West, but it is an aberration not only worldwide because most mm. other philosophers 
philosophers are not like that. They start with the individual. Um, but it's even an aberration within human hist- uh, sorry, Western history. Mm. Uh, because Greek and Romans were not, did not espouse this kind of universalist top-down uh, sort of approach. Um, and neither did the, you know, anyone else until very recently. Um, mm. So this, this is kind of a post-enlightenment thing. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I feel like uh, f- you might say that the ancient philosophies and even the, the ancient religions are having kind of a resurgence today because there is a push away from that individual responsibility. It's, it's becoming a very, uh, th- there is a lot more speak about, you know, the group responsibility and, and tribal responsibility. I think it's very interesting to see that play out. And I think it's interesting to see people come back to these ancient philosophies to, to yeah. kind of get inspiration. And um, I was wondering if we might go right back to the start again. <laughs> and I sure. wanted to uh, discuss briefly, if we could, uh, what the conditions were in Athens that led to such a, uh, I guess, a, led to the conditions where more and more people could think and express their ideas clearly and share those ideas. Because firstly, the fact that Zeno was shipwrecked and then he, he's in this city and the first place he goes to is a bookstore, that says something about the city and it says something about the times. And then the right. fact that the bookstore owner says, well, there's a philosopher walking by right now, like kind of says that, okay, philosophy was really important in this city. There were a lot of people thinking enough that you could literally look out the window and say, there's a philosopher walking by right now. What were the conditions in Athens that, that, what were the conditions preceding that time that led to Athens being such a hub of information? And do you think that, sorry, this is a long question, but do you think that that can tell us something about the kind of political situation that we would like to be in in order for ideas to flourish, I guess. Yeah, right. No, that's a good question. So philosophy itself, at least in the West, did not start in Athens. Um, it started, well, depends on who you ask, but it started in, in, in Miletus, which is uh, a city uh, that in, in, it's in modern day Turkey, but it's, it's uh, uh, mm. East uh, Athens. Uh, the first philosophers we hear of, uh, Thales and Aximander and, and Aximenes, were all from Thales, uh, mm-hmm. from uh, from um, Miletus. And um, but it definitely moved to Athens, and Athens became the center of uh, Western philosophy uh, mm-hmm. in the beginning. Well, why? For a number of reasons. One of them, of course, was that Athens was a very prosperous city, and mm-hmm. you know, in order to philosophize. Uh, you have to be in a place where people are going to, you know, support you otherwise or pay, mm. pay you or, or support you in one way or another. So it has to be a, pro, uh, you know, uh, economically viable place. Mm. Otherwise, people tend to be concerned more about uh, how to put food on their plate uh, um, at night and not about sort of philosophizing. Yeah. Uh, so one reason is that it was a prosperous city, but it wasn't the only prosperous city in, in, in Greece, for sure. Mm. Um, what set it aside is that it was, of course, also the center of democracy in Greece, mm. uh, right? So now democracy for the Athenians was something different from what we understand today. It was actually literally, you know, you know direct democracy by direct majority. Mm. Uh, you know, the assembly would vote, and if you had a majority, you win the day. Um, mm. So it was, in, in a sense, it was a limited major, uh, a limited democracy because, of course, it excluded. Um, you know, people who um, were slaves, uh, for sure, women were excluded, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Nevertheless, mm. for the time, that was by far the most democratic place yeah. in the world. It's the, the birthplace of democracy. Well, democracy also means that freedom of speech was a value in mm. Athens. It was highly valued. And so both education and freedom of speech were highly valued. That's what made for fertile grounds for philosophers uh, that even if they were not from Athens, they came to Athens uh, mm. in order to place their trade and you know to, to talk to people and so on and so forth. Then went on for a, a, a number of centuries. It ended essentially uh, around 86 BCE uh, because at that point Athens made the mistake. This, so this is way after the, be- the beginning of Stoicism. This is way after the death of Alexander the Great. Mm. And um, what happened was that the, although the Roman Empire had not started yet, we're close to the beginning of the Roman Empire, but not quite. And uh, what happened in, around 86 uh, BCE 
is that Athens made the mistake of aligning it itself with King Mithridates of Pontus, uh, which was an enemy of the Romans. Hmm. And it's a mistake because it turns out the Romans, you know, won. And yeah. uh, so the Romans punished, uh, you know, the Athenians as a, as, a, as a result. And the Roman general Sulla walked into, you know, marched into Athens and basically put fire in the whole, whole place, um, looted the place, brought a bunch of statues and documents and um, hmm. books back to Rome. That caused a diaspora of philosophers who studied, you know, who left Athens because it was no longer a viable place where to practice their trade, and they went in a bunch of other places, including primarily Rome. Um, mm. So that tells you that you need a place that is, you know, doing well economically, you know, wealthy, um, you know, generating wealth that is open to. Uh, freedom of speech, so a democratic place, mm. uh, and that is, you know, um, viable in certain terms of sort of prosperous in a, in, a, in, a, in a sense. And you can also ask a, a related question, which is why is it that all of these philosophies that we refer to as Hellenistic appeared in pretty much the same short period of time, or mm. you know, a number of decades? And likely the the the, the answer there is that. The situation was um, very interesting from a historical and, and perspective at the time. We're talking about the period, the Hellenistic period that starts with the death of Alexander the Great and ends with the back, Battle of Actium in 31 BCE. The Battle of Actium is where Octavian, who later became the first Roman emperor, uh, beat uh, Cleopatra and Mark Antony. And that mm. was essentially the beginning of the, of the Roman Empire. So what so we're talking a period of very uh, large turmoil, where mm. things were happening at a grand scale that people had absolutely no control over. Your world was going to be upside down from mm. one moment to another. Right? First, there was the end of the Peloponnesian War and essentially the destruction of Athens as a major power in Greece. And then uh, Alexander the Great sweeps down and, and conquers all of Greece and beyond. And then Alexander dies young and, and uh, his followers, you know, his, his heirs sort of divide the empire in, into three major chunks and they start fighting against each other. So more turmoil to come mm. all the way until the Romans finally fight, get in and sort of settle, settle things down. So one can argue reasonably that a lot of these philosophies arose in a time where there was a lot of turmoil at a grand societal scale and when people felt like things were outside of their control, they were they were changing very rapidly, and they needed some kind of point of reference. Hmm. Interestingly, the same kind of suggestion has been made for other philosophies. It turns out that Buddhism originated in India about two or three hundred years before Stoicism under very similar social and political conditions. Hmm. At about the same time, Confucianism originated in China also under very similar social and political conditions. So one can make the argument that, you know, Periods of turmoil are, are good for philosophy. I suppose. Yeah, damn! I I really really appreciate you leading us to that direction because I think that that's that's such an important thing to realize that, that humans in some ways need to be pushed up against a corner in order for their minds to really be yeah. opened to you know exploring what's important. And do you think that we're seeing? another kind of resurgence today. I, I've, I've felt very strongly that the twenties are probably going to bring us some of the biggest challenges that humanity's ever faced, but also yeah. some of the biggest opportunities. Right. And I think, I think that that's one of the reasons and going back to what you're saying, like we're, we're really in a, a somewhat of a state of turmoil in the world right now, where a lot of people are confused. There's a lot of polarization but you also see like a massive turnout to people turning to philosophers and thinkers. You you, you could point to people like, say, um, you know, Sam Harris. You could point to people like Jordan Peterson, people who, who are constantly selling out giant, you know, theaters, uh, you know, just yeah. to sit there and speak to each other about ideas. Yeah. And it's, it's almost as if, we're in another one of those periods. Do you think we're in another one of those periods where people are I think starting we are. to think? Unfortunately, those two examples you brought up are not one of my, two of my favorites. 
<laughs> particularly Peterson. But um, yeah, I think we are. And I think actually we've been yeah. in that situation for some time now, which explains not just the resurgence of stoicism in modern, you know, in very recent time, the last you know, decade or so. But even, for instance, these, the favor that Buddhism has uh, found in the West in the 1970s, yeah. from the 1960s and 70s on, uh, or after World War II. I mean, think about it this way. The last century, we've seen two world, you know, world wars. Um, we've seen the, the first deployment of atomic weapons. So we now live in a, in a situation where we could literally self-destruct any moment. Yeah. Um, you know, um, uh, we're now facing, on top of that, we're now facing the uh, very likely uh, uh, scenario of a climate collapse mm. um, over the next, you know, decade or two or something like that. And politically, we're not doing that much better. Uh, mm. Democracy is on retreat worldwide. Populism mm. is on the rise. Uh, uh, you know, so. And then yeah. on top of that, let's let's add artificial intelligence, which could be the 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 death of us or the you know the the ultimate yeah. survival of us. Yeah, and then you've got yeah, life right. extension, and there's so many there's interesting things ahead of us. That. You know, there are a lot of people that are worried about that. I'm not. Um, for I mean that would take a whole different show just to explain. Yeah, I'm not necessarily know. saying I'm worried about it or that right. I am approving of it. I'm, what I'm saying is these are very important issues to discuss, very important opportunities to discuss, and that's bringing a lot more people out of the woodwork to discuss them. Right? It's like it, there's yes, there's we are yeah. in a situation again of existential crisis. You know, uh, uh, large looming threats instability and so on and so forth so and on top of that we're also seeing we've been seeing over the last few decades a decline of traditional religion mm. right. so uh the the number at least in the west the number of so-called knowns the ones that the people that don't actually subscribe to any particular religion is being increasing significantly yeah. and well if you don't have a religion you still need a, I, I would argue a framework to to mm. live your life to to think about what you're doing and why you're doing it and so on and so forth and that of course is what philosophies are, mm. are for that, that's what a philosophy of life is in fact I actually tend to think of, a, of religions as a type of philosophy of life yeah so um, because they provide you with the same basic elements uh, an ethics which is a notion of how you should live your life mm. and a metaphysics there is a notion of how the world actually works mm. those are the two components and often a third component which is the practice yeah. um, so those are the components of both religions and philosophies of life and so if religion goes goes down then philosophy then, then people turn to philosophies you, you're not going to be able to live your life without some kind of framework of mm. reference to tell you where to go and what to do and why are you doing it mm. Yeah, no, I, I think that's. I think uh, this is the perfect place to kind of wrap it up here. I think we've we've come to a place where we've brought it to the modern age now, and I think uh, you know people could hopefully get from this that it's important to keep on debating. It's important to keep on discussing these ideas, and 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 also taking the best ideas from all of the great thinkers and adding them you know, in, in, in an effective way to what we know as modern stoicism, you know, like, like they did back then taking the best ideas and leaving the, the bad ideas and, and trying to move it forward. So, um, yeah, Massimo, I really, really appreciate your time today. I've, I've really appreciated this conversation and, um, thank you. I hope we can have you back many, many more times. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Everybody, there you have it, my interview with Professor Massimo Pigliucci. Now, it's always a pleasure, and as I said before the show started, make sure you head to the links in the show notes where you can find all of his books and everywhere that you can follow him. And also, if you are new to the show, if you're new to the podcast or to my YouTube channel, make sure you hit the subscribe button so that you get to keep on hearing great content just like this. So thank you so much for listening and I'll talk to you next time. But until then, I hope that this episode has helped you on your rise to the good life. Ciao.